WFAE members and Mazda of South Charlotte, committed to Mazda's focus to ensure every element of a car is designed around the driver. More at MazdaOfSouthCharlotte.com. This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. The legislature granted Mecklenburg County an option to increase the sales tax by a quarter cent for whatever the community deems necessary. With that as a backdrop, Charlotte's Arts and Science Council recently proposed the county increase the tax and use the revenue to fund the arts. The fundraising model that the ASC has been using for decades has took, it took a major hit during the Great Recession and has never fully recovered. They are the first to admit they don't need all of the revenue this tax would generate, so the remainder is proposed to go to parks and greenways and to education. Not everyone is in favor of this idea because we only get to do this once. Those opposed see other more pressing needs facing us right now with even more in the pipeline. And they have other reasons for opposing the move. Voters, however, will make this decision on Election Day, November 5th. Nearly 10,000 people have already voted, with early voting continuing until this Friday. So if you haven't yet voted, we encourage you to stay with us this hour as we hear from both sides about this sales tax decision. Joining me on the stage at Spirit Square's McGlowan Theater in front of our live audience are representatives from both sides. Daryl Williams is the chair of the Partnership for a Better Mecklenburg. They are running the campaign urging citizens to vote for the sales tax. Welcome back to the program. Good to see you. You have to say something because it's radio. They can't see you nodding. Glad to be here. Okay. <laughs> also in favor is Mecklenburg County Commissioner Susan Harden. Thank you for joining us. Welcome back. Good evening. The opposition is led by former Mecklenburg County Commissioner Matthew Reidenhauer. He's also the organizer of the Mecklenburg Tax Alliance, the organization opposed to the tax increase. Welcome back, Matthew. Thank you for having me. And Pat Cotham, Mecklenburg County Commissioner at Large, is also opposed, and she is on our stage here at Spirit Square. Welcome. Thank you for inviting me. And thank you all for being here in our audience tonight, too. So let us begin by catching people up, listeners up, on why this sales tax hike came into being, why it was proposed, and who proposed it. As I understand it, Daryl, the idea came from the Arts and Science Council, correct? That's right. Why? From a committee. Well, uh, several years ago, I guess back in 2014, the arts and science, the arts sector decided that based on workplace giving and some of the funds not uh, being like it had been in the past, that they needed to look at a dedicated revenue source for arts and science, arts and uh, arts funding. And so they put a study group together. I mean, they lost from, from uh, since the um, recession, they lost, they went from 11.3 million down to 5.7 million in funding. And so it, it's really, it was important to try to look at how to, how to deal with that, how to make sure we come up with a way to fix that. So I want to get into all the specifics, and we will, of all of this and more as we go through the hour. But first, I want to find out why each of you have taken the positions you have. Daryl, you're, you're, you're front and center in this and for the tax increase. Right. Why? Well, because I know the impact that it can have on our community to help transform our community, our kids. We see that we're dealing with economic mobility issues. We're dealing with a lot of disparities. I think arts and culture can help bridge our community and bring us together as a community and deal with a lot of other issues that we have uh, dealing with. Um, as we look at uh, all the things that have impacted us, uh, we got school issues, we got parks and recreation disparities. We look at, we're 50 out of 50 uh, as far as uh, economic mobility. I really think, looking at this, I really think this, uh, this, this uh, tax increase would help bridge everything and make sure that the, the, uh, we have equity throughout all of our community, that everyone get a chance to participate in arts and culture and make sure we improve our schools and also the uh, schools and parks. We have a lot of issues related to uh, things that are just not being taken care of with, between the city and county budget. And so Susan sure. Harden, you're on commission. You're one of the seven commissioners who voted yes. It was seven to two on the county commission to put this up to a referendum, and that's the only way the tax can be raised. The voters have to say yes or no to this. 
you came to city council, you say, not as a politician, but as an educator. Why are you in favor of this? Yeah, Mike, I'm a professor of education. I'm also a wife and a mom, and I have two daughters. And um, I believe that arts and culture and education and, our, and parks are fundamental to what make great people and great communities. I have two daughters who participate in a small arts organization focused on youth development, and they're mentored by in individual artists. And they get exposure to great art, but they also learn things like compassion and character building and leadership skills and inclusion. Those things are what is so important to their development. And I think every person ought to have access to those opportunities. I really believe that it is within this place, within this arts organization, that they fit in. And we need places where all people can fit in in, in our community. This issue has strange bedfellows on both sides because there are conservatives and liberals, Republicans and Democrats in favor of this. And the same is true of the opposition. Uh, the man you replaced is sitting next to you, former county commissioner Matthew Ridenour. Uh, she's in favor. You're against. Why? Well, thank you. So, uh, as 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 an organizer for the Mecklenburg Tax Alliance, we've heard uh, I've heard uh, a lot of reasons why people in the community have opposed the tax increase. And and to your point, they're not all Republican talking points or all Democrat talking points. They kind of span the spectrum. Um, no one's going to say they, they don't support the arts or they don't find value in the arts. I mean, if that's the best argument that anybody can come up with for being for the arts, um, we need to do better. Everyone supports the arts. Look, I've performed at, at Theater Charlotte. I've performed at Central Piedmont on their stage. Uh, no, like I'm not going to perform now? I, I, you know, I might b b break out a, so a song later, if you like. Uh, some fade well, We might music. have a grant for that at some point. <laughs> uh, you know... <laughs> <laughs> But, um, but, but there are a lot of reasons that folks are opposed to the tax increase. For one thing, priorities in the community. Um, this isn't Matthew Reidenauer or just the Mecklenburg Tax Alliance saying what are our priorities, um, but we've actually seen through surveys and whatnot what the priorities in the community are, such as things like affordable housing always comes at the end at the top of the results as a priority in the community. Things like transportation, uh, the Silver Line, which the city, of course, is discussing that right now. So. To some, I would just say there are a lot of reasons why people are opposed to it because of uh, primarily the priority uh, within our community and whether funding this private organization uh, is really the best use of our last quarter cent sales tax increase that we have. So Matthew Ridenour, for those who don't know, is a Republican, but sitting next to him, also opposed to this, is a Democrat and an at-large member of the county commission, one of the two Democrats who voted no because it's all Democrats on county commission. And Pat Cotham, interestingly enough, another example of being a strange bedfellow, you are a trustee of North Carolina Blumenthal Performing Arts, but you are opposed to this. Why? Well, just to clarify, I was a trustee for seven years, um, but I have been associated proudly with the Blumenthal on the Education Committee for 18 years. Okay. Uh, but I enjoyed um, being a, a trustee. And I am also a supporter of the arts. Um, I take my grandchildren to the theater. I go myself. Um, it's very important to me. But my experience is seven years on the county commission. I have, and probably many of you know where my passion is, and I try to help struggling families and homeless people. I'm very involved in mental health. I'm very involved in the human need. And I certainly believe that the arts can help a lot of people, but when they don't have a place to eat, when we have like last year, we had 4,500 ch homeless children in CMS. When we have people living in cars and we have people on the street, none of them have ever come to me and said, if I could just, we could just do 25 million for the arts, you know, my life would be hoped so much better. I, I believe that the, we need to have more discussion about this and um, I, I do not think it's the top priority of the people in Mecklenburg County. The data shows that affordable housing is the, is the, um, the top need in Mecklenburg County. Well, what about that, uh, Daryl Williams? You said in the very beginning that this 
quarter cent sales tax hike would go to the arts, parks, recreation, education, uh, greenways, and it would also help address, I, I want to put words in your mouth here, but equity issues, some of the economic mobility issues That's that right. we have. Mm -hmm. How? How would this help economic mobility? Well, number one, I think when you look at arts and culture and how it can engage our community uh, and get them involved in all the issues that we're talking about, whether it's transportation, housing, health care, I think arts and culture, it's proven, you know, based on various reports that arts and culture can help bridge our community, bring us together, and, and help deal with all of these issues and make sure that it's done the right way. So, so you're saying that these arts and culture can help bring these issues to the forefront to audiences who may not have a greater understanding of that? It, it, it helped, or, or, it, it, or that somehow this is going to help a poor kid who can't get a sandwich for lunch? Well, what happens, it brings people out of their homes and get engaged in their community to, to deal with the issues that we're talking about, affordable housing, transportation. It really brings them out. And get, and get them connecting with the neighbors to help deal with, to make sure that the affordable housing we do is done the right way, make sure transportation is done the right way. So I think being able to engage our community and bring us together as a community to work holistically, we can't deal with these things individually. I mean, Mike, know? this is really about changing systems. Yeah. We if can't. you look at education, if you look at arts and culture, Every expert that I've talked to about affordable housing says we cannot build our way out of this problem, that we must address the system, we must address the underlying economic conditions and invest in economic mobility and systems change and income inequality. And let me give you a great but example. But how does this Well, do let that? me give you a great example of a, one program in Mecklenburg County that we do this. It's called the Jail Arts Initiative. And it's a partnership between Mecklenburg County and the Beckler Museum of Modern Art. And in this partnership, we do programs in the jail and, and, and residents in the jail go through an extensive process. And Dr. Keith Cradle, who is the, the program manager, says that he believes that it is absolutely transformative, that it changes the trajectory of the residents in the jail, that it is both therapeutic and it gives them career aspirations. This is economic development. This is about investing in the cultural sector and the jobs they bring the to the community. Do have, the arts do have the power to bring people together and they do have the power to humanize us. But Matthew, Pat, uh, what, what is your response to that? Particularly with the jail component of this. I've, just, I've never heard of this before. so. It's interesting. I mean, is that something that you see value in, if that works that way? Regardless of whether we, there's, there, there's a, a impact in the jails uh, with, with arts education or, or, or with, with children, I, I, I'm sitting here and I'm finding it really hard to believe that we're talking about affordable housing and you referenced a child that doesn't have a sandwich and we as a community think that $22.5 million in perpetuity going to the Arts and Science Council organization is the best way to get that child a sandwich when he's hungry at the end of the day. I think there are direct investments we can make if we feel like things like, hey, I'm having to work three jobs and I'm having to, having to spend an hour and a half on, on uh, several bus uh, reroutes uh, and and uh, and coordinating a schedule. I'm spending an hour and a half, two hours, three hours away from my family because there's no infrastructure in place for me to quickly get to a job that pays me a livable wage. That's direct investment that can be transformative, and you're not going to convince me that a jail program is the best investment of our $22.5 million as a community. We're going to get deeply into this as we go through the hour here. The Arts and Science Council says that they are in crisis, but not all of this money will go to the Arts and Science Council. And when we come back, we'll talk about what it would mean if this thing doesn't pass, if they're in crisis, what does that mean to the arts? What does it mean to parks and greenways and to teacher salaries? Some more from Spirit Square's McGlowan Theater at Charlotte Talks. Good evening, it's 720. You're tuned in to 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR News Source. If you're listening to a special Charlotte Talks forum about the proposed sales tax hike live from Spirit Square's McGlowan Theater. Seconds. If you've missed Stand any back. part of the conversation, it will air again tomorrow morning at 9 on Charlotte Talks and will be available wherever you get podcasts. Just a reminder, early voting continues through Friday and Election Day is next Tuesday. 
In addition to the sales tax proposal, there are races for the mayor's office, city council, and the school board. If you haven't yet made up your mind, check out profiles of the candidates and much more in WFAE's voting guide. That's at WFAE.org. Charlotte Talks is on your favorite social media websites. Follow along with the show, upcoming events, and behind-the-scenes fun. We're on Instagram and on Twitter, at Charlotte Talks. Okay, we're back in 30 seconds. Hey, it's Nick Delica now, here with some questions from our listeners. Jonathan writes to us wondering why Charlotte wasn't built on the Catawba River when many cities were built on a waterfront. And Yusuf asks, why do some sidewalks abruptly end around Charlotte? And Ben okay? says he once heard Concord was the site of an ancient volcano and wants to know more. You can vote for your favorite question at WFAE.org and then make sure you're subscribed to the FAQ City podcast when we find the answer. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're coming to you from the McGlowan Theater at Spirit Square with a conversation about the tax to support arts, parks, greenways, and uh, education. It would be a quarter cent increase in the sales tax. The referendum is on the ballot right now because early voting is underway. And it will be decided by a very small percentage of citizens in all likelihood. We'll talk about that, too, with Daryl Williams and Susan Harden. They're both in favor of this. Daryl is the chair of the Partnership for a Better Mecklenburg, which is the organization spearheading the campaign to get you to vote for this. Susan Harden is one of the county commissioners who voted yes. Matthew Reidenhauer is the organizer of the Mecklenburg Tax Alliance, the organization urging you to vote no. And he's joined on the stage here at Spirit Square by Pat Cotham, city, uh, county commissioner commissioner at large who also voted no. And you wanted to respond to what we were just talking about, Pat. Oh, thank you. Um, we have more than 27,000 people that are in need of homes. Um, they are struggling. These are people that make 30% of the average medium income. Those are the people that are hourly workers. Somebody who has maybe makes $25,000 for a family of four. This is where our big need is. And these are the people that I spend my time with. And they are people that every day, all they're thinking of is how they can survive the day. How are they going to get their kids to daycare? They're going to be riding the bus. Um, and many of them, especially women with children, are on the bus two hours in the morning and two hours in the afternoon. They don't have time or to go to things that might be available. I'm thinking about them. When the Arts and Science Council presented this to us, I was very, cons I was also against this in 2014 when it was presented uh, and it failed in that election. But when they presented it and they kept talking about their fundraising and I kept telling them to work harder well, let me, and work smarter. Can I respond to that, that Mike? I, Just I, to, I, as the commissioner, I, the, I, I want to say that I, our Mecklenburg like County budget my, is I believe Comprises. Commissioner Cotham had the floor, Commissioner Hardin. <laughs> We'd like to hear her thoughts. Yeah. Go ahead, Pat Cotham, go ahead. Mm -hmm. I complained to them that they had not updated, that they were still raising money like they did in the 1990s. People give money differently now than they did then. They hadn't changed. And I, I have a hard time with your public tax dollars going to a private organization. All right. You want to respond before I, I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this because we have a lot of territory yeah. to cover. I want to say that Mecklenburg County government provides the human services for our community, and if this passes, it will it will allocate 0.5 percent of one percent of the budget. We have a two billion dollar budget. This is a small allocation for arts and culture, and it really does address the systems in our community rather than you know, providing for more programs. At one point in time, the Arts and Science Council was one of the premier arts funding organizations in the country. Uh, I think at its height, it was bringing in $16 million a year in donations from people through workplace giving for the most part. Uh, but it's fallen now to $5 million a year, and uh, that's the latest figure put up by uh, Krista Terrell. She's ASC's Vice President of Communications and Marketing. They say that they are at a crisis point. What does that mean? And if this vote goes to, onto the no side, what does Charlotte lose? 
Well, when, when you look at uh, the whole crisis issue, I guess back when funds were coming in through workplace giving, they were being provided by some of the, uh, and when, they, when, they, when workplace giving decreased, they were provided by more larger corporations to fill the gap. But what happens when that happens, they, there's not equity. They direct where those funds go, and a lot of folks in our community get left out. The artists, small individual artists, small arts organizations, they get left out. So it's all about equity. But they've always been left out. The only way, well, it's going to get worse, though. I think the only way to make sure that there's equity, it, that, that needs to be public funding, and that's why several cities across this country that we compete with they're looking at public funding to make sure that everyone participates and that there's equity throughout every part of our community. Pat, Pat Cotham just said that the last time this came up in 2014 and it was defeated by the voters and it was in reverse. It was for education first, arts second, not the way, not this way. This time it's arts first, uh, parks and ed education second. But she just said that when it came up the last time, she said, you people are raising money like you did in the 1990s. You need to work harder. You need to change your, uh, the way of doing business. So Susan, why should it fall on taxpayers of all stripes to support the Arts and Science Council? Well, I think what Daryl said is absolutely true. I believe everybody should be ac have access to the arts, and I believe that the way you ensure equity and equal access to public goods is providing public funding for those goods. We provide funding for public education because we believe everybody should have access to it. But the Arts and Science Council's own designated review study committee Mm -hmm. admits that donors' attitudes began to shift away, and these are their words, shift away from giving an umbrella to, giving to umbrella organizations like the Arts and Science Council toward giving directly to individual arts organizations. That indicates a shift in the public's minds on how they view pledging and spending their money on the arts. And this tax would seem to fly in the face of what the public has already decided. Well, I think, I think that we've looked at, we've, uh, the study group in 2018 looked at different communities and how they fund arts and culture. I believe the arts and cultural sector is worthy of support. We support corporations through tax subsidies. We support sports organizations through tax subsidies. I absolutely believe that the cultural sector is worthy of support. It provides $360 million of economic development to our community. A two, $22 million investment, which returns a $360 million economic benefit to our community, is a great return on From investment. 2005. <laughs> From 2005 to 2008, the Arts and Science Council got $16 million in uh, contributions every year. When the Great Recession hit, that number began to decline, and it's been in a free fall ever since. Is that current decline in workplace giving indicative of disinterest in the arts on the part of the people who have given traditionally at the workplace, or the fact that people are struggling to make ends meet, they're working two jobs, three jobs, they haven't gotten a raise since the 1970s, and they are tapped out? So what we know about philanthropy in our community is it's actually increased. We've seen given, giving actually going up in our community. It's just that people do it in different ways now. When they design But they're the, also obviously not giving it to the arts then. Well, they are giving it to the arts. They're giving it directly to the arts organizations, to some arts organizations. So then why does the ASC right. need it? Well, well let, me, let, me, let, let, me, let me respond. Uh, you know, several places we've been, people make it all about ASC. It's really not about ASC. It's what is best for our entire community. ASC would actually be leveraging the dollars, you know, because, you know, as a, as a young man in my neighborhood where I grew up, we didn't have nothing but basketball. You know, young kids need to learn, be able to look at other opportunities so they can prosper, not just sports. And so I think if, if we don't make sure that our neighborhoods, in all areas of our community, understand arts and culture and able to engage in it, uh, that cannot happen without public funding. It's just not going to then happen. Then let me flip the coin, because Charlotte and Mecklenburg County do support sports. We have money tied up in Bank of America Stadium and in the, in the basketball arena downtown. 
you know, you know, you know we're going to be asked for money for a new stadium. You know that's going to happen. Yeah, I'll be fighting so, against that, too. Against so that. If, if we give money to sports, why shouldn't we give money to the arts through tax dollars? Well, I think that begs the question, why should we be supporting sports with, with tax dollars and not just assuming that we should? Uh, if, 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 and I, I disagree uh, that, that it's not about the Arts and Science Council. It most certainly is about the Arts and Science Council because that's the organization which will be receiving, again, $22.5 million uh, each year going forward. Um, if this is such a priority, funding the Arts and Science Council, and they are going to be in a crisis mode, let's look at the numbers. Last year, they had a budget shortfall of just under $2 million. The county commission in 2018 had a $1.7 billion budget. This year, that ballooned up to a $1.9 billion budget. Of course, that's an increase of $200 million. Their shortage was, let's say, $2 million. If this is such a priority, and the commissioners felt like this was such a priority for our community to fund the Arts and Science Council, could we not find those $2 million out of the $200 million that we increased the budget this year? Instead, what's, being, what's happening here is we're constituting a new organization, a new board of directors for the Arts and Science Council with m more county commissioners, city council members, and people in the community on the board. They have admitted they do not know how the funds will be dispersed within the community. There are a lot of big question marks. Mm -hmm. What's happening is the Mecklenburg County taxpayers are being asked to be the venture capitalists for a new organization. It is essentially a new organization taking the old name of the Arts and Science Council. They're saying, here's a new board of directors. This is sort of what we want to do. We don't really know how it's going to be spent, um, but we need $22.5 million a year to make this happen. I don't think that it is the responsibility of public taxpayers to be venture capitalists for the Arts and Science Council organization. So what about that, Susan and Daryl? I mean, there are a lot of unanswered questions about how this money, at least on the art side of this equation, will be handed out because the parks already have an organization in place that are part of the county and funded through county tax dollars. The Arts and Science Council has traditionally been a, a private organization, a nonprofit. Uh, will it remain a nonprofit? Are you just going to add some officers from the county commission? Or are the county commissioners going to appoint people to serve on the board of the Arts and Science Council? Well, let me, I can speak to that because it's really the county commissioners who are developing the governance process. I want to let everybody know that this has been a long-term process. It started in 2014. It's been a process of strategic planning, reporting, community engagement, and public hearings. We have done a thorough job in figuring out how we're going to do this. How are we going to do it? So what's going to happen is after the voters approve this, there'll be an extensive community engagement process where we listen to the community isn't that about how we're going to create this board. Isn't putting the cart before the horse? You're asking no, people to go. No, absolutely not. What we told, no, no, here's why. Because it must be community-led. We told the citizens of this community that if we were going to have equity, we were going to let them be a part of this board well, then why and the, be a part well, why of the, the decisions. Then, Susan, on where why the hurry? Well, the, this there is a hurry. This go on the ballot at during the presidential five election. Years. It's not a hurry. We've been at this for five years. You just passed the governance years. structure, what, a month ago, maybe? I would say that, and, and the vote is next week. So, to his point, why don't you delay this until next year's election and referendum when you have an opportunity to play out the new board? and produce some outcomes and say, look, it's working, taxpayers. Now bring this forward to the taxpayers. Instead, you're just asking people to invest in some unknown, well, we want to do this, and we're going to do that. Mike, we had a community engagement process. We had three hearings. Not one person asked us to postpone this. This is the time that our community has. We've been dealing with this for five years. We have a, pl a terrific plan in place. We're going to do a community engagement process. We're going to listen to the community. We're going to constitute a new board. It's going to have elected officials, community members, artists. And they're, they're, after going through an extensive community engagement process, we'll decide how you go about the process of Pat, applying for the board. Pat Cotham. OK, nothing is guaranteed. We need to remember that. Nothing is guaranteed. I want to bring that up right now. The wording that the voters will see on the ballot when they go into the voting booth is this, quote, local sales and use tax at the rate of one quarter percent in addition to all other state and local sales and use taxes for or against. What will that say to people who don't, who don't listen to this program, who don't read the newspaper, who have no idea they're voting for a sales tax increase? 
Yeah, it'll be important. That's why it's important, shows like this, of getting the word out and what this is really going to go towards. You know, a piece that we haven't talked about is the parks and teachers. and what. But that's just as do. there is no expression on the ballot as to how this money will be used, mm -hmm. there is no guarantee once we say yes that it will be, in fact, used for the purposes that you folks are saying it's that going to be right. used for. That is exactly right. There that, are no guarantees, and that is a, a major flaw in this. There is no guarantees, but here's what I can tell you, is that the county commissioners have been very transparent about where they intend for this funding. This to county go. commission? This county commission, and they've directed the county... So when you lose your seat to, to Matthew, <laughs> <laughs> what happens then? <laughs> She's not going to lose to Matthew. <laughs> well, and we're not running against each other right now, so that's not that, yet. Yeah. <laughs> so. And let, let me say this: you know, um, nothing is guaranteed, and you know, I think that when you but look. But that's not true. Things nothing. are guaranteed. There are the, tax. No, the, every wait, year, wait, every wait. Year there are taxes that we pay that can only be used for certain things. I keep being told this on this program almost every week. We can't touch that money because it's dedicated to, to this particular revenue stream. Why can't this be dedicated to this revenue stream in perpetuity, guaranteed? So at least we feel good about it. Because it's, it, it's an elected body that change every two years. I mean, every year- but the, the hotel budget, motel every, tax has not changed every two, two years. There's a $2 billion budget that changes every year. But, 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 Mike, that's what the legislature gave us to work with. You should know that 42 counties of the 100 counties have passed this, and that is what they gave us to work with. It's a shame to let this opportunity go to waste. We are at a critical point in our community. We have the opportunity to invest in our cultural sector, in our teachers, how troubled and in our would, How troubled would you be if this county commission changes complexion in two years, four years, six years, and they decide enough of this. We can put another basketball arena up for this money. Let's use it for that. How would you feel? Well, I mean, I, I would feel sad about that, but that's why I'm asking How voters to hold feel? us accountable. Well, yeah. And let me say this. I think the community will hold elected officials accountable. Okay. So if it changes, it ought, it ought to be because the community wanted it to be changed. So this money, this tax money, is not going to be just for the arts. The ASC proposed this. They said, to their credit, they said, we can't use all the money that this tax would generate. It would generate $50 million. They're going to get 45% of it, the single largest chunk, while parks, greenways, education will take the rest. Uh, but the commercial advertising that your organization is running on television features education and parks, and it talks about field trips, and it talks about going to the Gantt Center. Hardly a word is spoken about the arts. Are you being honest with people? Well, you should know that a big portion of that cultural funding is to return field trips to our schools and to provide arts but programming. But forty-five percent of it's going to the arts. Are you being honest in your yeah. presentation of this issue? I hope we're being honest. I mean, we. How are you? Because education, we want to bring to the forefront also the benefits that, that this is going to provide for teachers and for parks. We want to bring that to the forefront because arts has been such a strong portion of that. But really the transformational, the shot in the arm this is going to mean for teachers to have a designated funding stream every year that will be provided for teacher assistants, school counselors, school psychologists. They have tremendous needs. But they're I'm getting $8 million, let me, let and the Arts and Science Council yeah. is getting 22.5. But some of that, 30 22, seconds. Some of that 22.5 will also be used to help educate students, you know, science and history in their neighborhoods. So education is not going to be limited just to the $8 million. We have to take a break. When we come back, we'll get into the nuts and bolts of this, where this money is coming from, where it's going, how it will be earmarked going forward. Uh, and more. So stay with us from Spirit Square at Charlotte Talks. Good evening. It's 740. Thanks for okay. tuning in. Listener funded 90.7 WFAE. You're listening to a special Charlotte Talks forum about the proposed sales tax hike live from Spirit Square's McGlowan Theater. We'll get back to the conversation in just a moment. Early voting continues through Friday, and Election Day is next Tuesday. In addition to the sales tax proposal, there are races for the mayor's office, city council, and the school board. We have profiles of the candidates and much more in WFAE's voting guide. That's at WFAE.org. 
And a programming note, we have another WFAE public conversation coming up in November. Join us for a conversation about affordable housing in Charlotte. We'll be at the Harvey B. Gantt Center on the evening of November 12th. Details to come, but save the date and stay connected to upcoming Charlotte Talks events at WFAE.org slash Charlotte Talks. Okay, 30 seconds. I think that his death raises an alarming possibility. And that is that someone who apparently did not vape THC, did not buy any kind of products on the black market, could also become very sick and die from a vaping-related illness. I'm Michael Barbaro. That's today on The Daily from The New York Times. Coming up at 9 on 90.7 WFAE. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're coming to you from the Blowin Theater at Spirit Square with a conversation about the proposed quarter cent sales tax hike for arts, parks, recreation, and education that you will find on the ballot when you go to vote in the November election. Daryl Williams is the chair of the Partnership for a Better Mecklenburg, the organization sponsoring or putting forth uh, advertising and other uh, in, in, Helpful hints on helping you to vote yes for this. Jeez. Susan Harden is the county commissioner who voted yes. Matthew Ridenauer is organizer of the Mecklenburg Tax Alliance, which is an organization that's encouraging you to vote no. And Pat Cotham is a county commissioner at large who voted no on this. So let's get some nuts and bolts, Susan. What types of purchases would this tax be levied on? So this tax would be levied on... Um, most purchases, let me tell you, there are some major exclusions. So the basics, the, the everyday expenditures that most people provide, take in, you know, do in their lives that will be excluded. So things like gasoline, groceries, prescription medications, rent, and mortgage. So those things are excluded from this sales tax. What about services? So, so my understanding is um, some services are included, but I'm not sure about that, Mike, to be honest. You go to the, you go to the mall and you buy a tie or you buy a skirt. That will be that taxed. That will be. And, and you buy a movie food. ticket, will that be taxed? That, I think it's movie tickets are taxed. You pay your cable bill, will that be taxed? I don't think the cable bill is okay. taxed. Diapers, so, yeah, I, diapers, prepared foods, those would all be taxed. It's the, it's the unprepared foods at the grocery store, so let's not. So restaurants yeah. you'd be, pair, you'd be restaurant. paying the tax prepared on? Prepared foods will be taxed. Yeah. Uh, so and let's and I would also, if I could, sure. the term groceries is misleading. It's uh, food, but like if you go to the grocery store and you buy paper plates or toilet paper or paper towels, that will be taxed. So it's, you can't, I struggle. Again, wording, um, I, I do feel that the four group has not been clear because they, in the beginning, they talked a lot about groceries and gasoline. There's never been sales tax on gasoline. There's a gas tax, but it's not, it's on by the gallon. It's not a sales tax. We've never had that. We've never had taxes on prescriptions. So they keep bringing those things up, but that has never been taxed like People this. who oppose sales taxes in general uh, say that they oppose them in, in part because they are regressive. They hurt the people who have the least money uh, the hardest because everybody has to buy things. You have to. Uh, so how, how do you strike the balance, Daryl, between what you think this will do for the community, particularly in terms of economic mobility and equity, while at the same time the very people who are in most need of economic mobility and equity and who are at the lower end of the socioeconomic spectrum are gonna to have to pay an extra quarter cent on everything they buy. Yeah, you're talking about five cents for every $20, which is a small price to play, pay for the impact that this can make on our, on our community. I think when you, when you think and when you talk about being able to make sure that everyone participate economically, I mean, you, you, we haven't talked about the jobs in the, in the arts sector, right? The jobs that's gonna be created, uh, the economic development, Susan mentioned the impact. Uh, for people coming into Charlotte. How will this create more jobs in the arts sector than have already been created historically when the, when the Arts and Science Council was running full tilt boogie at $16 million? That's not going to happen. I mean, we have to have public funding to make that happen and to make sure the whole community get to participate. And so that's why this is being done. I mean, those dollars are not there. Where will the money go that's earmarked for education? It's $8 million to education. 
So that money will go to support teacher supplements. We know that teacher pay right now is a fundamental issue and it's impacting the teacher pipeline. I'm a professor of education at UNC Charlotte and I can tell you that right now there are zero students who are preparing to be physics teachers. We have a crisis in our pipeline, education pipeline. We need, it's, 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 we want to make sure that we are attracting the best teachers into our community. And so that's one thing, the teacher supplements. The second thing that is going to go towards is teacher assistance. It was such a sad day when the legislature took away teacher assistance. I'm in classrooms all the time. You should try to teach kindergarten with 23 five-year-olds and not have a teacher assistance. It's one of the things the teachers told us they were desperate to get back funding for. And then the last thing is we know that the social and emotional needs of our children are so important. Mecklenburg County supports the human services, and so making sure that children have access, students have access to school counselors and school psychologists, super important. Go ahead, Pat. I was just going to say, Matt or Pat, you go, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll go, ahead. go next. I was just going to say that, um, that I, think, I think she just made a great case for why maybe the, arts, uh, the education portion of the, uh, of the tax revenue should be higher and maybe our arts and science a little lower. Um, I, I would say that it's, it does seem, and I say this respectfully, truly, it does seem a bit of a privileged statement to say it's only a nickel on $20 yes, because maybe right. it doesn't apply to anybody in this room, but it most certainly impacts people in our community. Um, and then real quickly on the jobs front, so I served on the Economic Development Committee for a few years on the County Commission. We would get these reports on studies of why CEOs would relocate their businesses to, uh, to counties, and they would take these surveys. And every, every time, taxes, the tax rate in that county was one of the top three reasons why a CEO chose to relocate a business. So when we talk about jobs, it's, I'm in risk management. There is very, a very strong case to be made for an unintended consequence that yes, we might be helping support jobs in an art sector here in Charlotte, but what we're actually doing though is, is, is making it harder for our economic development uh, uh, to, to, in the city and the county to relocate jobs to Mecklenburg. So I was just handed a note, a representative from the Arts and Science Council says that the number I've been using on workplace giving is wrong. Uh, I, I've been saying $16 million at the height of it, and I think I got those figures from the last time we did a show with the Arts and Science Council, at which time they did not dispute that figure, but they're saying that workplace giving went from $11 million to $7 million during the recession and is still dropping. The city and the county already kick in tax dollars to support the arts. Will that continue if this passes? Pat? No. No, it will not. So is it a zero-sum game? Also, How much money do we give told, now? We've been told, and I struggle with that, that we will... See, there's an example of how things work. Just like the Arts and Science Council will not be raising money anymore because the money will come from the taxpayers. So we've been told that uh, the county will not provide that, and the city has said the same thing. How much money is that that we give them now? I believe it's uh, around $2 million. Okay. So the difference is $20 million. <laughs> uh, if the Arts and Science Council, if this vote passes, can no longer raise money, can the individual organizations that they support, the Charlotte Symphony, Opera Carolina, the ballet, others, can they individually raise money? Absolutely. If, when this passes, this will constitute only 20% of the, the public funding will constitute only 20% of the overall arts funding sector. The parks are getting, uh, what, $18 million out of this? $17 million, parks and greenways. Will the money coming from this, if voters say yes, replace money that's already going to parks? or augment money that's going to parks? Absolutely. This will be dedicated funding to address land acquisition. One of the things we know is how far behind we are in our land acquisition in our community. Developers, you see all the development happening. This will provide a designated funding stream for land acquisition, for senior programs, for youth programs, and for uh, deferred maintenance. But I would also say, again, there are no guarantees here. And a lot of our um, parks funding and greenways we buy uh, are in floodplains. And right now, people are paying taxes on those floodplains. It doesn't make sense to buy them early and let them sit there for a few years and not get any revenue from them. 
and because um, those are that's land that we can always buy because it's not going to be developed. But right now we're getting revenue from it. But there, you know, there again. I just want to be honest with you. There's no guarantees on anything here, and I struggle that. It's kind of like I say, you go to the polls, and what if they just say, well, just vote Republican or Democrat. We'll tell you later who it is. That's kind of what this looks like to me. So I, am, I struggle with this. I struggled with this in 14. I have seen boards overturn things. Our, our past board almost overturned the, um, the, the vote of the people from 2013. Uh, it's for um, the soccer to have soccer in Memorial Stadium. Uh, there were, finally we got enough votes to stop that, but it certainly could have happened. And I remember say, and saying how I was so frustrated. So the people voted, we can't overturn that. But there were certainly commissioners who were ready to overturn that. And from that, I got the state award for uh, greenways from the Park and Rec Association because I fought hard for greenways. So again, I just want people to know the facts, that there is nothing guaranteed here. Things can change, it's very fluid. And I think the whole structure, I think when this was made by the Republican legislature, with all due respect to my Republican friend, they made it so it was difficult. They made it that way. But you mean to raise the quarter cent sales tax? I mean, this, this, this vehicle that we're talking about right. uh, was made to be difficult because they really didn't want tax, they didn't want it. So right. they made it very hard. And again, I don't think we've done the work ahead of time to, uh, I don't think we've done the work on the front end. Susan, I, I know you so want to comment. So I want to talk about, I, I respectfully disagree with my, my commissioner colleague. In fact, you should know that seven of the nine mayors, this is a bipartisan effort, and look at the support from the leaders, the, the le elected leaders in the community. Seven, of, excuse me, five of seven mayors, including Republican mayors and Democratic mayors, in the Mecklenburg County support this. Almost all of our former city mayors support this. We have support from city council members. We have, look at the bipartisan coalitions this has brought together. We have support from the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance. We have support from the Mecklenburg Council PTA. We have support from the Sierra Club and Greenways for Mech, which I think you are on the board of, Matthew, actually, and that endorses it. And so, I mean, we have all the climate leaders, for example. So this has been a broad coalition of people who really believe that this has been a thorough okay. and, and this is the best thing for our community right now. Daryl. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, we're way behind on park spending. Uh, we're 96 out of 100 when it comes to the cities that we compete with. On a, on, a, on a national basis. I mean, that includes Durham, Raleigh, uh, Greensboro. Uh, we don't spend enough money for our parks. Mm -hmm. And so the $17 million will be looked at separate from the rest of the, the parks budget to make sure that we, the, the, we're held accountable to how that money is spent. Another one of the concerns that people on the other side of this have brought up, Daryl and Susan, is the fact that we have these needs in the community that we face right now, affordable housing, economic mobility, et cetera, and we know we have unknown needs coming up in the future. Some of them are known. We're going to be asked well, to put money to toward a new stadium. It's going to happen, mark my words. So if we, we can only go and raise this tax one time, is this the issue to use it on? I think, I, I know it is, because again, you look at some of our neighborhoods, they are dilapidated. We have, we have kids that are playing in parks that are, that are, that are not, that are dangerous, they, they don't look like parks on the other side of town. And Matthew we need and to Pat. Have, we need to make sure there's equity throughout all parts of our community. Matthew and Pat, if this is, the, we can only do this one time, won't there always be issues unknown in the future? And there will always be a reason not to do it, because we can only do it once. Well, there will always be people who are opposed to it for one reason or another, just like, just like the tax alliance. We've cobbled together folks on both sides of the aisle who are opposed to it. Um, so certainly, but what we have to ask ourselves as a, as a community is if we've got a one shot at this opportunity, is this um, the priority that bubbles up ahead of everything else that we as a community have previously stated is our priority? And, and one thing, quick thing about the $17 million that would go to the parks and greenways. So Mecklenburg County currently purchases land acquisition for parks via a pay-go fund. You basically save up money, you spend it, and you pay as you go. Um, 
Folks, surveys have consistently shown people have little faith in government at any particular level. Do we really as a community feel that, it, that maybe this, commi this commission and maybe not this uh, county manager, but do we really feel that in a few years from now, someone's not going to look at $17 million coming in from sales tax, $17 million that's in their pay-go fund and say, why am I spending it both when I've got a dedicated stream, money, a revenue stream here in the sales tax? I mean, I th it, it, it will, I can assure you, I mean, mark my words, it might not be in two years, five years, or ten years, but at some point, the, the sales tax will uh, replace we, what's currently in the budget. We are really short on time, but I have to ask this question because there are people in this audience who remember Angels in America. Mm -hmm. Is it a good idea to have politicians making decisions on arts funding? It happens in communities all over, are all but, but over. But we the know United what States. happened here. We do, we do know what we happened, but we've learned a lot from that experience. And I can tell you that if if we want to be a city of a million people with a vibrant arts culture that has that does so much economic development from our community, we know how communities do this and do it well. If you look at Denver and Minneapolis and Austin, these are communities that we've looked to to see how to design this and 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 this the recommendation that we have put in place of this governance structure provides the best model of citizen led and public official involvement and separation such that those types of issues okay, I'm don't stopping come you up. there because we're going to take a straw vote we have a minute left how many of the people in the audience had already decided on how they were going to vote or have already voted in one way or the other. How many of you had already decided before you came into this room, applaud, we're going to get up the applaud meter. Okay. How many, how many of your minds were changed by this conversation? How many of you will be voting yes? How many of you will be voting no. I think the eyes have it there. Uh, Daryl Williams, Chair of the Partnership for Better Mecklenburg, Susan Harden, a, a member of the County Commission who voted yes. Matthew Ridenauer, organizer of the Mecklenburg Tax Alliance, and Pat Cotham, County Commissioner at Large, who voted no. This is an issue on the ballot that simply says they're asking you to say yes or no to raising the sales tax by a quarter cent. We'll see what happens. Thank you all for being here. Thank you all.